Welcome everyone to our AIHI webinar. My name is Chrissy Clay and I am the coordinator of these webinars for the Australian Institute of Health Innovation at Macquarie University. We would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which everyone is joining today and we're very much aware that we have people from outside of Australia as well. I am on the land of the Warramatical people of the Darug Nation who have uh, whose net customs and cultures have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. We extend our respect to elders past and present and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people participating in our webinar today. So the National Policy Roadmap for AI and Healthcare was released last week, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers to unpack that today. Thank you for joining us. So today we'll be starting off with Professor Enrico Coera, who is the Director of the Centre for Health Informatics here at the Australian Institute of Health Innovation. He's also the founder of the Australian Alliance for AI in Healthcare. We we'll also be joined by Professor Karen Burspaw, who is the Executive Director of RMIT's School of Computing Technologies and co-founder of the Alliance. Dr. David Hansen, CEO of CSIRO's Australian eHealth Research Centre and co-founder of the Alliance, and also Professor Farah Magrabi from the Australian Institute of Health Innovation and the co-lead of the Alliance's Safety, Quality and Ethics Working Group. So I'm sure there'll be many questions as we go along today and comments, so please feel free to use the Q&A function throughout and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end of the presentations. Now I'd like to hand over to Professor Enrico Coera to get us started. Thank you very much, Chrissy, and welcome all to um, this uh, very interesting and timely uh, uh, seminar. Uh, as Chrissy mentioned uh, last week, last Wednesday, we launched uh, the National Policy Roadmap for AI and Healthcare um, by the Australian Alliance for AI in Healthcare uh, in partnership with um, a number of very important organisations, the CSIROs, eHealth Research Centre, uh, the Digital Health CRC, the Australian Institute of Digital Health, and RMIT and Macquarie Universities. Um, and, and as you will see later on when I go through the roadmap um, for you, um, it, it really has been a very large labor of love to, to come to this point. It's involved uh, literally dozens and dozens of people this year, and the process actually has spanned over the last two to three years. Um, it's important to, to frame what we are going to do today for you. Um, what we are going to talk about is policy specifically, which is where governments and agencies get to set rules, legislation, regulation. Um, we're not gonna be talking about everything that needs to happen for AI to be successful. For example, in terms of um, implementation strategies, technology choice, et cetera. Those things are uh, certainly critical, but they're not part of the policy argument. The other thing that you will notice is that we make quite specific and often very few recommendations in every area. Uh, and that's because we're guided by asking the question, what will be critical to happen over the next couple of years that would actually push the whole agenda forward? Um, and who would own those um, recommendations uh, and, and who would have the capacity to action them? So with, with that framing, you might see why some things are mentioned in one way and not another way. And, and I'll certainly try and add some context as we go. Um, so um, without further ado, before we get to the roadmap, we've got some outstanding people to give you um, an insight into the framing of the challenges we have. Uh, and I'm going to hand over first to um, Professor Karen Vespoor, uh, who's going to ask that very important question, what makes AI in healthcare so special? Thank you so much, Enrico, and I'm really happy to be with you all today. Um, I'm going to be presenting this from the perspective of somebody who is fundamentally an artificial intelligence researcher. And I think it's important to start there because the rest of the world is looking at health and thinking, why is why are we talking about AI in health as something different from just AI? You know, we're in an environment now where AI has 
almost become a commodity. And there is this notion that we can simply take AI methods um, that have been developed for general purposes and apply them in AI. And so I think we need to remind ourselves about maybe why we need to take a little bit of extra care in thinking about the use of AI in, in the healthcare context. And where I usually start with that um, is to remind people that health is really important. It's important for us as individuals, it's important for our families, it's important for society, it's important for the economy that people are healthy and contributing to, to the economy. Um, health just matters. And so we need to take extra caution to um, when we think about using technology and particularly such a powerful technology as artificial intelligence in the healthcare setting. And fundamentally, health is about people. And this is a really critical part of thinking about AI in the healthcare setting because AI is based on data. And in fact, when we think about AI systems, often we trivialize um, the, the, the information that's provided into these AI systems because it is just data. And so I like to ask people, who is your data? Let's not talk about what data you have, but let's think about the fact that this data represents people. And that introduces a whole host of, of things that we need to think about as we're developing AI systems. The data is highly sensitive, it's highly personal, and it has significant personal implications to drive decision-making with artificial intelligence using, using this data. And this becomes a critical element of developing AI systems. We need to protect the data. We need to make sure that we're not um, inadvertently leaking the data or exposing somebody's very personal health information because models are derived by looking at statistical patterns in data. There is the, the, the risk that we actually capture um, an individual's profile at a very, very subtle level. And that means that we might expose data inadvertently that, that will, will um, be violating the privacy of, of the person involved. So we need to be thinking about this as we're developing applications in this context. Of course, safety is paramount. Um, we can have systems that, that miss diagnoses or that propose inappropriate treatment plans that make errors that, that drive unsafe treatments. And we, we all of this can happen if we leave the, the, the decision-making and leave the diagnosis entirely to the machines. And so we need to be thinking about how we integrate AI into our, our healthcare settings and our healthcare systems in order to ensure that we do no harm. Health decisions themselves are extremely complex. There's many, many different aspects to making those health decisions. And when we think about AI tools, most of them are fairly narrow. And that means that applying health, uh, sorry, applying AI in the healthcare setting means that we need to be considering things outside of the AI. We need to look at patient history. We need to look at the values that the patient has about, about um, their, their health care. We need to look at their environment. We need to look at context. And we need to constantly be asking the question of what is not in the data? What information is relevant to a treatment decision for a patient um, that is not captured in, in the data? This all impacts on how we use AI. More importantly, health AI also requires very multidisciplinary teams. We need to bring the experience and the knowledge of many, many different kinds of people, ranging from different clinical experts um, to different care providers to different technical experts. And they all need to be in the teaming. And this is different from many other applications of AI where it's okay to have the technical people driving the entire agenda. Healthcare is a very variable thing, right? We, um, there's huge variations in clinical settings, in clinical workflows, in the data itself, in documentation practices. 
And for AI, this means that, that there's a whole host of questions that arise about how we leverage AI in, these, in the healthcare setting. Particularly, it's not a given that AI models that are developed in one context or in one clinical setting or in the context of one clinical workflow will naturally just work in a different setting with different data and different documentation practices. We need to be thinking about how we contextualize and localize these models to these different settings or make them robust to the generalizability. And that's not obvious always. We also need to be thinking about the governance of health data use and the software itself. We have a range of industry specific standards that are about health and the use of AI and the use of data in health will have different laws and different regulatory environments and different expectations associated with it. So we can't just insert health AI systems into our healthcare system without considering these contexts and these constraints. Of course, AI has a huge potential impact in health. We can really see AI as a partner in trying to develop our learning healthcare systems because AI can dig into the data and find really subtle patterns in the data. And so it's worth us making all of this effort and bringing these complex teams together and making sure that we manage the privacy and sensitivity of the data so that we can build systems that achieve the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve. And I would suggest that we always need to be thinking about having um, augmentation of health decisions through AI rather than replacing the AI. And so we can think about models in which AI is used to surface information that's relevant to a decision rather than making the decision entirely on its own. And this is important because as I mentioned, the healthcare setting is complex. I will leave it there and I will hand over next to Dr. David Hansen. Thank you. Uh, oops, thank you, Karen. And that's a great <coughs> overview of, of the challenges of implementing AI in healthcare. Um, so I just want to remind everyone that we are taking questions today. And there's a question and answer box, which you should be able to access. And we've already got one question in there, which I'll let Chrissy uh, answer at some point uh, in the text. So, so um, uh, before we hear more about um, some of the other challenges and, and, um, and, and more about the roadmap, um, yeah, and just talk for a few minutes about why we need a national approach uh, to how we implement artificial intelligence in healthcare in Australia. And I want to, want to um, um, emphasize, and I'm not talking about search side and, and, and that, that's part of the roadmap, but not the whole thing. Uh, implementation is of course uh, very difficult uh, <clears throat> in general in digital health, health around the world. And we've seen lots of, of challenges of that. Uh, and AI lays, uh, gives an extra layer on top of that difficulty. But when it's come to artificial intelligence, over the last five years, we've seen an increasing interest in artificial intelligence in general and in artificial intelligence in healthcare. Um, uh, you know, three or four years ago, we, the UK invest over 250 million pounds in an NHS AI lab uh, within the USA, release an artificial intelligence strategy a couple of years ago, uh, and the World Health Organization released their report on uh, AI and health um, a number of years ago as well. Um, so we're definitely seeing internationally that, that, um, that countries aren't just taking a, 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 a sit back and, and wait for AI to happen approach. Uh, and uh, most countries around the world are actually looking at how they can take a, a consolidated and, and coordinated approach to implementing AI in healthcare. This year, of course, has been really exciting for AI and healthcare. And I think um, the release of ChatGPT uh, over 12 months ago has, has taken AI from uh, out of the realm of, of, of the techies and the, and the uh, researchers and, and really opened up to, to uh, the general public. And it's been really exciting to see AI uh, have a level of interest that we haven't seen previously. And so we, uh, with the result, though, that we're now seeing um, the UK government have their AI safety summit a number of weeks ago. We've seen um, the Biden administration release an executive order 
on safe and secure and trustworthy intelligence. And of course, we've even seen Chinese government um, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, urge countries to unite in tackling AI challenges. So this isn't just a national approach, this is an international issue how we actually use AI uh, across society, but particularly uh, our interest, of course, in health. Uh, we've also seen in Australia a number of the learned academies and other, other peak bodies release AI reports, um, uh, really detailing the challenges and opportunities of AI from, uh, from the government, uh, from government, from organisations, uh, and from CSIRO, and, and we've seen a number of reports from all of those organisations. Recently in Australia, uh, we've, we've seen the government fund a National Artificial Intelligence Centre uh, hosted by CSIRO's Data61, and they're running a number of um, initiatives, including the Responsible AI Network, which will be, be about accessing tools and guidance to support implementation of AI uh, generally across society. Uh, this will help. <coughs> uh, uh, the, the aim of the AI uh, centre is really to be coordinated across industry and we're working, of course, to, to take what comes out of there and apply it in health. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, <coughs> the fact that the government this year invested significantly to ensure that we have really good digital health systems in Australia. So we've seen more money to um, uh, being invested in digital health in Australia than we've seen before. And this will give us, we hope, um, both more and better data. And we've always already heard from Karen on the importance of data uh, to help us, um, uh, to help drive AI generally and make sure that the algorithms uh, can be developed well and safely and um, so, so uh, not only will the digital systems help uh, drive better data in healthcare, but it also it's a backbone for implementing AI in healthcare. You can't um, implement AI without those digital systems uh, to take the algorithms and the and the tools to the clinicians. Um, so, so with the population and economy of Australia, we can. Uh, we can be really competitive. It's a real entity for us to, to work as a whole country, um, to be competitive internationally and implement AI properly into uh, our health system. So there's, there's great opportunities, but we do need to cut it as a, as a whole of country effort. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so I think that's my key message is that uh, internationally, there's what's happening as a country, we can do a great job. And so I'll finish there and hand over to Farah, who will be talking about ethics. Over to you, Farah. Thanks very much, um, David, um, for providing um, that sort of broad perspective um, internationally and, and sort of also locally um, in terms of the AI scene. Um, so Karen has already um, touched on many of these aspects, but. Um, you'll see when the roadmap is presented, um, safety, quality, and ethics is, is top um, in terms of the priorities, uh, and rightly so. Um, it's foundational to applying AI in healthcare. Um, thinking about quality, it's going to guide where uh, we apply AI, and then the how sort of uh, the safety and ethics determines how we go about doing it because we do want to be doing it appropriately and responsibly. We want to be able to apply AI um, to realize benefits and minimize um, any unintended effects. Um, and that's because with AI and healthcare, um, you know, safety is definitely critical. Um, but there are um, inherent tensions um, if we are purely um, driven by technology um, and particularly as the approach um, to development uh, is essentially sort of move to move fast to break things. Um, and when you're in health, you kind of don't really want to do that. Um, and so if you've seen any kind of or been using any general purpose AI technology um, like ChatGPT or BARD for the last year, um, you will have seen that they are rapidly deployed and, and essentially fixed on the fly. Um, it leaves the onus then on the users to be highly um, vigilant in detecting um, and correcting for error, errors. But in health, we need to make sure that AI enabled services are as least as are, are as le are at least as um, safe as existing um, services, if not um, safer. 
And so our approach um, to AI should essentially be problem-based rather than um, technology-driven. Um, and that's because our health system is under sort of enormous pressure at the moment. Um, if we consider the quality of care, um, Jeffrey Braithwaite and colleagues, um, they talk about the 60-30 challenge. Um, despite you know, concentrated and ongoing efforts, only about 60% of care that we have um, is in line with recommendations. Um, about 30% is waste and 10% um, harms patients. If we're looking um, at the workforce, um, it's becoming clearer and clearer day by day, by day that we simply don't have the workforce um, to meet the demand. So it's not so much about you know, taking a healthcare service and replacing by it, by it by AI and questioning, look, why can't this be done by a human? I think we just don't have that human capacity. Um, and as we uh, you know, race ahead, uh, to what's kind of to come, well, we can't, uh, you know, do that without really thinking about climate change, um, because the healthcare system itself um, contributes to about 7% um, of carbon emissions. 80% um, of emissions come directly um, from service delivery. And, you know, by cutting out waste, for instance, you can rapidly, um, you know, reduce the carbon footprint of healthcare. Um, so it's clear that, you know, the system needs to adapt to increasing demand, but then to, uh, and also deteriorating environmental conditions. Um, but we also need to mitigate um, the footprint um, of healthcare um, itself. Moving on to safety, um, drawing together, you know, work that we've been doing here um, at the Australian Institute of Health Innovation, uh, looking at medical device approvals um, and safety events around AI. Um, our research shows that it's much more um, than the algorithm. Um, we need to think about the role of the AI. Um, clinical AI at the moment um, is based on traditional machine learning models. Um, they're trained specifically on health data for specific um, health tasks. Um, these tools, they provide us information, they could be assistive, or they could be making decisions themselves. Uh, but our work has shown that around 50% of these are actually assistive. Um, they're providing important um, information or decisions, um, and really it needs to be checked by the user and verified before it is used. Um, take, for example, um, an AI tool that detects abnormal abnormalities on an ECG. Um, the clinician is expected to be checking um, the ECG alongside um, the AI. For the last year, we've had foundation models um, come on the scene with ChatGPT um, and, and similar chatbots. Um, these have enormous um, possibilities, both um, in clinical as well as in lower risk um, operational tasks. Um, but in health, they need to be carefully evaluated, um, preferably um, in safe, safe sandboxes before they use, um, especially if we're thinking about using them um, in clinical tasks. Um, regardless um, of the type of model that we have, implementation and use, as David and Karen have already highlighted, needs careful attention. Um, human factors, particularly because, again, our research has shown that they're more likely, at least four times more likely, um, to lead to patient harm. Um, and not to mention um, the interface with existing um, IT systems as well, because around 80% of safety events um, linked to poor data. And finally, um, moving on um, to ethics, ethical principles are essential. Um, they sort of provide the overarching kind of framework, not only for safety, but for security um, and reliability of these systems as well. Um, so Australia already has a national set of ethics principles uh, generally for AI. Um, and you know these, these are gonna be quite useful as we start to implement more and more um, systems in our, um, AI tools in our healthcare systems. Um, so starting off with the fact that we wanna make sure that AI is going to benefit individuals, but a society and the environment as well. We wanna make sure that it's respecting human rights, be inclusive and accessible to all. Um, we wanna ensure privacy um, and security. So essentially upholding privacy rights, data protection, um, ensuring security of data. And we want to make sure that any AI tools we offer deploy in healthcare operate um, in accordance um, with their um, intended purpose. And finally, there should be transparency and responsible disclosure um, so people can understand when they are being impacted by AI um, in healthcare and they can find out when they're actually even being engaged by um, an AI system. Um, and there should be processes to allow people um, to challenge the use and outcomes um, of an AI system. 
uh, people should be identifiable um, and accountable for the outcomes of AI systems and human oversight um, of systems should um, also be um, enabled. So with that, let me um, now hand over to Enrico to take you through the roadmap. Stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Farah. That's um, an excellent set up by all of the speakers. So let's see if I can now guide you through the roadmap. So I think um, my, my current mantra as we have uh, been talking about the roadmap is that um, AI is now too big to ignore, but in healthcare, it's also too important not to get it right. Uh, and getting it right um, is a complex consideration. Uh, so we, um, as a nation, we have a fractured health system. We've got state um, uh, components. We've got federal components. Um, we have private and public components. And anybody who's been involved in dealing with healthcare nationally understands that um, the complexity of healthcare and the nature of the system we have means making change uh, on a broad scale is always uh, challenging. So what we have tried to do with the policy roadmap is, as I said at the beginning, focus on directly actionable recommendations that over the next year or two, we think will make a big difference to our capacity to adopt and exploit um, AI in healthcare. Uh, it is not everything that needs to happen, and it is very much focused on what policymakers and policy enabled agencies um, can do. So uh, let's start with the very first section of the roadmap. And as Farah said, safety and quality was the number one priority um, of, of all the people who participated in the roadmap process. And, and I think it's worth mentioning what that process was. Um, it started actually two years ago in 2021, where we surveyed over 240 different Australian organisations for their priorities in healthcare. Um, and we continued that process over this year, refreshed it because of the implications of generative AI, um, and also had a very a very um, useful and engaging workshop with over 30 leaders uh, in Sydney uh, earlier in the year, where the priorities that you're going to see now um, really were polished and honed. And, and I have to say, um, given the, the disparity and the diversity amongst all the people who have participated, um, there is actually a very strong consensus around these things. So everything you're seeing here is because the participants in the process suggested they should be there. So safety, quality and ethics. Um, we make five recommendations. And the first one probably is the most important in the sense that it directly addresses this challenge of national coordination and fragmentation of responsibility. Um, so, for example, in the area of AI safety, uh, we know multiple organisations have a stake. There is the Therapeutic Goods Administration, the TGA. There's the Australian Commission for Safety and Quality in Healthcare, um, uh, et cetera. Um, we know that state and federal um, health agencies are involved, uh, so forth. And, and so we think rather than recommending another agency, you know, we don't want another agency to tread on the toes of the Australian Digital Health Agency. Um, what would be good would be for all these groups to come together in a single place to agree on what their shared priorities are, um, to agree on who does it, and to identify gaps amongst them where perhaps new activities need to happen. Uh, and, and I think without that central coordinative place and, and that remit, then it's going to be hard for much anything else to happen. Um, very much things will get missed or, or delayed. Um, we next talk about um, the assurance of safety for AI. And, and what we say here is things should be developed and deployed within a robust risk-based safety framework. Uh, let me unpack that. Um, right now, the TGA certifies AI through its software as a medical device process. That's what's called the pre-market process. And they, based on the, the likely risk of the technology, that it'll go through various routes. So things that are most likely to um, have clinical use and have potential for harm, get the closest inspection. Our challenge with AI is that we are talking about technologies that are adaptive uh, and that the current processes are assess once, sign off once. 
Um, so how do we check that technology that was um, uh, perfectly fine two years ago and has now changed is still doing a safe job? This is where post-market comes in. Um, in other words, this is where we survey the performance of technologies in the real world after they have been deployed. Um, and we do the same for drugs, we do the same for um, vaccinations. Uh, part of the challenge here is that the data reside in multiple patient safety incident repositories nationally, and uh, there is a strong argument for TGA to be able to bring all those together to allow it to survey. So um, TGA is doing uh, a, a really good job with the resources it has, um, but it knows there are plenty of open risk areas to be looked at. Um, and so I think this area really needs our strong support. Um, safety is not just a question of pre post market testing of technologies. It's also about making sure that the people who use the technology are capable. And this is where accreditation comes in. This is where we make sure organizations um, are using AI in a fit for purpose way. And, and in keeping with our uh, mantra of using existing um, organizations and giving them clearly actionable recommendations. We think the Australian Commission for Safety and Quality in Healthcare, um, which regulates um, or accredita accredits healthcare organizations, should be able within that process to add in safety and quality practice standards. Um, there is already a pathway to do that. Let's use that. Um, I've seen questions in the chat already about um, generative AI um, and TGA already has remit to look at and accredit um, generative AI clinical systems. So there is a route to do that. Our problem is that um, a lot of the new use cases for generative AI um, are being developed by um, people who may not be familiar uh, with the current regulatory process, who may not be traditional members of the medical software industry, and so who don't really understand that um, there actually are strong reasons to go through the um, regulatory process. Um, for example, um, people are saying, let's use ChatGPT to generate um, specialist letters, and patient notes, and, and are asserting that that's not a clinical use, that that's a, some sort of a back office use. Um, it very clearly is a clinical use because if I get a letter that's got an AI-generated hallucination in it, that it gives the patient the wrong diagnosis, gives the patient the wrong medication, that there are patient safety concerns there. So um, what we have said here is, um, knowing the TGA has remit in this area, that what we need to do is to go out to the community and urgently communicate the need for caution in the use of generative AI clinically and make sure that any such use is regulated, is, is tested, is fit for purpose. Um, and the, fast, the last recommendation here is really, um, territory covered both by Karen and Farah, which is to say that there already is work happening in the National Task Force on AI run out of the Department of Industry on a national AI framework. Um, what we are hoping is that the healthcare specific aspects of that framework do get emphasized, that we don't just end up with a, a minimum that will be applicable everywhere, but doesn't really capture the nuances of the challenges in healthcare. Workforce is another really high priority area. Um, if we are going to be embedding new technologies across the health system, then the workforce needs to be able to, to use them safely and effectively to know when to use them and when not to use them. Um, this is an area where it's actually difficult to think of who owns uh, the remit to do things. Um, for example, a lot of education will come out of organizations like universities or professional bodies like the Australian Institute for Digital Health. Um, what we focused on were two actionable recommendations um, where we would get a driver for the development of training, workforce programs, etc. So firstly, APRA already has what's called a shared code of conduct. And I think 12 professional organizations sign up to that shared code of conduct. Um, and we see that um, that's a perfect vehicle where we might add in components around uh, shared safe use of AI. So let's use a pre-existing process as much as possible. Um, it's important to note that not every healthcare profession goes through APRA. There are other other professions that go through other bodies. So hoping that can be brought together. 
We also know um, in recommendation seven that there are some colleges, for example, the Royal Australian College of Radiology, um, who have already pushed forward um, uh, codes of practice for their members about the safe and effective use of AI, clearly leaders in the area, both nationally and internationally. We heard during the consultation process from other professional bodies who said, we also would like to do that, but we don't have the in-house capacity to do that. We don't have the expertise to do that. Um, and so one of our recommendations is that we need to find a mechanism to assist professional bodies and by providing the resources and examples uh, from uh, other places, both nationally, nationally, internationally, for how to do that. Consumers, um, really, you know, the lifeblood of the whole thing. How do we make sure consumers are actively engaged, firstly, in the discussion about how AI is used um, with them and for them? And also, how do we make them effective users of um, the technology when it is consumer facing? Uh, there is a strong case, I think, for some form of national program for digital health literacy, not just for AI. As we've heard, um, AI is one component of the larger ecosystem. What we are focusing here, I guess, is on the specific challenges of AI. Um, and uh, it's very clear that AI brings real challenges, for example, around bias in data. Um, and so one thing would be, for example, for people to be able to ask the question, um, was this AI trained on people just like me, um, or do I have to look elsewhere? Um, or, for example, to make people um, skeptical, you know, to make them understand that just because an AI says a certain thing doesn't mean it's good, um, for them to value systems that have been tested and regulated. So, for example, Health Direct has a front of house digital symptom checker um, that will help you work out what to do with your symptoms. Do I see my doctor? Do I go to the emergency department? Um, People use ChatGPT in the same way, but ChatGPT has not been tested and certified um, for that particular use. Another critical group amongst the consumers are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities who have particular sensitivities uh, around their data. Often their data has not been collected because of um, where those communities are or has been collected poorly. Um, and when it is used, it needs to be used in a culturally safe and trusted manner. Uh, we do have very good examples internationally of how this has happened. And Canada, for example, has a digital health institute for their um, uh, Indigenous population, which is run by um, uh, that group and, and really has control over how that data might be used. Um, and, and there are pre existing principles of Indigenous data sovereignty we can look at. So we we're very happy to make that recommendation. Uh, the final one here in consumers is to recognize that those professional codes of conduct that I spoke about just recently um, need to emphasize uh, shared decision making. In other words, if you're going to be using AI, you need to be using it in a way in which the, your patient is a part of the decision making process and understands the risks and benefits of using the AI. Industry is another critical piece of the whole thing. Um, and in a, in a way, industry is at the pointy end. Uh, they will be the ones who will be designing and implementing nearly all the digital technologies we see, and they'll be designing, implementing the AI um, that we will increasingly see over time. Um, so we need to make sure industry gets it right. Industry, if it flourishes, generates jobs. It also generates sovereign capability. and. and by sovereign capability, I mean that Australia has the ability to develop its own systems, to modify systems um, as need be. We saw during the first six months of COVID, for example, how the world shut down and Australia was left to its own devices. We had to uh, do everything from finding uh, ways of creating rat tests, uh, even creating uh, sufficient quantities of, of hand cleaning equipment or masks were a challenge. So we need to be able in Australia to not import AI only, but to be able to develop ourselves to ensure we have some sovereign capability. So our recommendations for industry are actually uh, quite lengthy uh, and, and, and I think well thought through. Um, the first one is, uh, and it might, might sound a bit obscure to people not involved in this process, is for national procurement guidelines. So essentially when a health service asks for tenders to provide technology, though they're, they're going through a procurement process and they will issue a guideline which will say, um, 
this is how you must answer um, our tender, and these are the things we expect you to do. So, so this is actually a great place to put in safety, quality, um, data quality requirements. Um, and industry has told us in our feedback that they welcome clarity in this area, but the big problem is that there is huge variation in the procurement process. So if there was a single national guideline on how this should happen, that would really make Australian industry much more competitive. Um, we have we have a small AI health industry compared to other nations, uh, and the small medium industry or enterprise area of SMEs in particular require support. Um, it's surprising to note that we currently get tax support for innovation, developing new technologies, but we don't get support to SMEs for um, the cost of regulation. Yet it turns out the cost of going through something like an FDA or TGA process can be 50 to 70% of the total cost of product development. So we're recommending that there's some consideration how, about how that tax incentive scheme can be moved to cover regulatory compliance costs that will make a huge difference to local industry. Um, uh, these technologies will also potentially be reimbursable by government. So for example, if I do an ECG that's interpreted by AI, that might be billable. Uh, and um, this process is new to the medical software industry, although it's pre-existing. And they do need assistance in understanding how to prepare technology to be assessed for reimbursement through the government uh, system. Um, we've heard clinical data mentioned a few times, and one of our recommendations is uh, to ensure that industry has access to high quality clinical data often coming from repositories that have been developed for research purposes um, and uh, that we need to find ethical and consent-based consent -based methods for accessing those data. Um, at the moment, the big multinationals have access to very large data sets. It's a huge competitive advantage. And if we want to level the playing field, we need to make sure these national assets that we have support national industry. Um, many of these things that I've mentioned could all happen through something like a national AI capability center, an organization that comes together specifically to help industry and SMEs in particular, helps them through things like procurement, um, the MSAC process for regulation uh, and reimbursement, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, helping um, professional organizations like colleges understand how to identify the competencies that they want their members to have. So, and we'll finish up with research. Um, research, like industry, is kind of critical uh, as a foundational piece. Um, the evidence base that supports the use of AI comes from research. Um, many of the technical innovations that end up in the hands of industry come from research. And so we need to make sure that we are competitive in this space internationally. Um, our challenge is that we appear not to be investing at the right rate. Um, we did an assessment of funding rates for AI um, projects through the National Health and Medical Research Council and the Medical Research Futures Fund, and 0.9% of all grant funding over the last five years was allocated to AI projects, in contrast to, for example, the, the hundreds of millions of pounds that uh, England NHS has funded into research in the area, or, or the large amounts of money and special programs available through the US. Um, an indicator of that is a recent paper that's just come out that looked at randomized controlled trials of AI around the world, again, over the last five years, um, and identified 84 clinical RCTs. Um, and um, really embarrassingly, from my perspective as an academic in this space, Australia contributed zero to those. You can see most of them were uh, roughly a third in the US, third in China, third in the EU. Um, um, Countries like Vietnam, Singapore, Rwanda, Malawi, all um, did some sort of work in the area, but probably because of the lack of funding, because RCTs are expensive, this is something that didn't happen. So our last recommendation is that we need, through those funding bodies, to really rethink our approach and provide targeted support for healthcare AI and make sure that the panels that are allocating that money have real expertise in the area. So that is my rapid walkthrough, um, the roadmap. You can access the roadmap at this URL. There's a little barcode you can scan yourself if you wish. Um, but I will stop now um, and we might turn to questions if maybe the panel can all um, 
join us, that will be great. And we'll see what we can do. Okay, so I've got your questions in front of me. Um, let's have a look. So there's a the first question really is about um, inclusiveness of uh, AI, making sure it uh, addresses health outcomes for diverse demographic groups, CALD patients, etc. Um, I have addressed um, the importance of, of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community. Um, I wonder if any of the other panelists want to say anything around addressing these groups. No. Uh, maybe I'll just, you know, I'll just add that that um, one, of, it's really important for us to be thinking about, you know, where the data comes from, how we're using the data, and one of the questions also, you know, talk refer to bias and misinformation, and I think bias, particularly from um, populations that are underrepresented in 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 the data. Um, is a real concern. So we need to be, you know, kind of very actively curating how we develop um, um, AI systems in this context, because we need to ensure that there is appropriate representation um, in in the data, and of course, capturing the values of the of of the communities that are that are represented in the in the data as well. So it's not easy, but we need to we definitely need to be doing it. Thanks, Karen. Uh, another question um, is really around where Australia sits uh, in terms of um, regulation of, of AI. Are we at the front of the pack, at the back of the pack? Farah, maybe you could answer that for us? I can um, kind of answer that one. Um, so Australia is a member of the International Medical Device Regulators Forum. Um, and so that that is a forum which has all of the medical regulators. And essentially what they do is they try to all stay in concert and in line with so this kind of uniformity um, across the globe. And that's because, you know, you may have a product that's approved um, in the US. And so industry would want to come and, you know, be able to um, deploy that here without having to go through an additional sort of process and vice versa. So products de developed here. And so the regulators are really trying to um, make sure that they're all sort of consistent or in harmony as much as possible is like what they like to call it. Oh, caught on mute. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, I'm done. You're good. Okay. Um, I have another question, um, which I might actually start again with Farah, but open up to the group. Uh, and it's a, a, a data quality question in terms of regulation. Uh, who determines at what point data is good enough quality um, uh, for safe use? Uh, and, and you know, my thinking here is that if we're talking about the, the policy space, we're talking about regulation and TGA, um, part of the TGA risk process requires provision of data. So I'm guessing far a part of the answer is that that responsibility in terms of data quality for testing and training is part of that process for regulation. Would that be right? Yeah, look, that is right. And, and generally, I sort of agree with that, but it also depends on the application, right? So um, you really need to kind of get specific. It's, it's hard to sort of say that data needs to be, you know, uniformly at this level of quality before you can even start to think about an AI system. I think it depends, like if you look at x-rays, well, what's the quality of the x-rays and how well do they need to be labeled before you try, try to train a system? So you, you need to kind of get down to specifics rather than the general sort of case. Right. Any other comments from David or Karen? Only that, um, you know, I think we've discussed, Enrico, the um, AI centre that, or the AI coordination centre that we've been discussing, uh, you know, potentially has a role to provide uh, high quality data for at least testing AI algorithms and things like that. Yeah. So, um, totally acknowledge the question. Um, and, uh, but I'd also back up what Farah is saying that um, uh, that explanation data was used to train the model and test the model is part of the TGA process. So to some extent yeah. that's captured in the TGA process. And because we have so many questions around data, I think David, you made a great point in your presentation, which is that in terms of policy, this already sits in the Australian Digital Health Agency's remit uh, and they have responsibilities for things like interoperability, standards. Um, so um, 
and and I think one of the reasons that it, it didn't jump out heavily in the roadmap process is because there's an assumption that that, that piece of work, at least at a policy level, is already clear. Would that be correct? Yeah, I think there's a lot of work going on at the moment into the use of standards uh, across healthcare and, 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 and that's such underpinning the uh, agency's interoperability plan, uh, which is about uh, interoperability of data across the healthcare system, uh, using standards to make sure it's high quality data. And so standards, you know, you're right, Enrico, we didn't make it part of the roadmap because we see it as something that's important, uh, not just for AI, but for, for healthcare in general. I'm, I might also just add a comment that, um, you know, to some extent, I, I mentioned the variability of the data that exists in, in the healthcare system and in healthcare settings. And to some extent, we need to develop AI methods that are robust to that um, lack of quality, right? So, or the noisiness of the data. Um, so we have to also ex acknowledge that there will be variations in the quality of the data. And that needs to be, part of, of how we develop our models um, so that when we deploy those models in settings where there might be less perfect, less than perfect data, we still have some evidence that they will function as we intend them to. Yeah, or, or that they are very clear that they're not doing so well when they answer. Um, right, have I a have... way to flag that, that, that yeah. it's, you know, That's right. lacking, exactly. lacking confidence. Uh, so we have a question here around generative AI, which um, we haven't talked about much, but you know, quite frankly, in the last 12 months has been transformational. It's really changed our understanding of how we can develop AI, at least in terms of smart interfaces. You know, conversational agents are remarkable in their ability to speak to us um, fluidly and persuasively, um, although, as we've also heard, they're prone to error, hallucination, and they're not necessarily knowledgeable agents. Um, so uh, this is a question that says assistive and decision support AI can be thoroughly tested, uh, unlike generative AI in the public domain. Um, does the roadmap address this threat? So uh, yes, I mean, I mentioned the fact that we we think there's a big issue in communicating those risks both to the community um, in terms of, you know, if you're going to be using tools, go to places like Health Direct um, and making sure clinicians know that if you're going to be um, involved in developing AI, with generative technologies, please go through the TGA process. Don't assume that somehow you're special and different. Um, does anybody want to comment on the challenges of generative AI? Yeah, um, I can go on. Go on, Karen, go, go. No, 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 you go. <laughs> um, look, uh, there's there's kind of more questions here around using generative AI for note summarization um, and, and generating reports. And, and I think whether, you know, Enrico's already sort of touched on the fact that, you know, these things tend to hallucinate. It does leave a lot of onus then on the user to be carefully checking these. And so, you know, even if we can assure ourselves that, look, we're, we're happy with the quality of reports it generates, it puts a lot of onus on back on clinicians. And, and I don't know how good we are uh, at, at sort of, you know, being able to check these thoroughly before we accept them into the clinical record. And I think that's kind of quite problematic because we know from even simple um, decision support, uh, you know, decision rules that we're, we're hopeless at checking them. Um, so. And the other, uh, Karen, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to, to kind of approach this maybe from a little more technical perspective, um, which is that um, the, 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 what we're trying to achieve with generative AI may not actually address the specific um, clinical problems that, that um, we want to resolve. So, I mean, where we're using it for summarization or for um, um, even um, um, sort of documentation of, of, um, a, a, of a clinical record or a patient, patient visit, um, Clearly, we need to have that review and the final accountability um, sitting with the, the clinician. But where we want to use it for kind of more speculative um, things, I think we really need to think about is a generative system the right way to approach that? Um, because there are many applications of, you know, say, large language models or, or the, um, the paradigm of, of deep learning, um, which are more effective in the context of a classification or a, um, um, 
a, a, a suggestion for a prediction of, of some some variety. So generative AI, you know, yes, I see Emma has commented that that um, they've the Mater has become begun a project where they're restricting the data itself um, to a, a private data set that they're you know controlling access to. But the problem is is not only about the the access to the data, it's also about the the um, predictive use of the data and the generative paradigm is just not um, necessarily robust in the context of the kind of uses that, that we want to make of it. We have to be really careful. Basically, you know, we know that these models hallucinate, make things up. So we just need to be sure that we're using models that are fit for the purposes we, we have. Thanks, Karen. So we're getting very close to time and there are very many questions. There's one here on, on, the, on ensuring we get value out of AI. Um, and, and this actually was a big issue in the workshop that we used early this year as a way of um, testing many recommendations. Uh, and, and comments came from um, individuals involved in procurement um, and, and developing and using systems. So people in the front end, and they said, really the procurement process is where they, they can stipulate that um, there is evidence that the technology being proposed really doesn't just perform technically well, but has an impact on clinical outcomes. So that is one way in which we can um, have, have a stick or a lever, as it were, to make sure that only, only useful stuff comes out um, and gets used. Um, there has been a process really, I think over the last three or four years where I've seen a lot of early AI research happen just because it could, because people had new technologies and they could find a medical data set. It is now shifting to people asking questions about what is a, what is a real problem that needs to be solved um, that actually will be taken up and make a difference. Uh, any comments from the panel on, on ensuring we get value from AI? Well, I think the, the workshop participants, as you said, Enrico, um, they were quite clear that, you know, when we're thinking about AI in healthcare in Australia, we need to sort of be driven. Um, and that's why we had quality put into that very first um, uh, priority area, because, you know, we had safety and ethics from the get go. Everyone always thinks about AI. But when we thought think about health and resources are limited, um, we need to think about where we use it wisely um, and for the problems at hand. And that's how the quality got put in. Um, so, you know, hopefully if people sort of pay attention to the roadmap, they would be um, doing things that need to be done rather than just because they can be done. Yeah. Karen or David, any other comments? Good. So, look, I think with just about a minute or so to go, um, I, I will... Um, start to wrap up now. Um, there are, as I said, many more questions and I wish we had more time to get to them all. I hope we've done a good job of at least answering most of the, the big ones there. Um, I, I want to thank um, David, Farah and Karen who have been um, really uh, pivotal supporters for the whole process. Um, also, uh, Pippa Doricott, who's not on here today, but who is kind of the Chief Executive Officer of the whole Alliance and keeps us honest and has made the whole roadmap happen. I want to thank Chrissy, for making today happen. Um, I encourage you all to read the roadmap, um, reflect on it, understand its very particular approach, which is to focus on national policy um, specific to AI, as opposed to trying to do everything. Um, and we look forward also to the feedback of many people uh, over the next few months on how they think these things can happen um, and, and give support to the overall agenda. So with that, I will thank you all. And I'm not sure, Chrissy, if you want to say farewell or not. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming on the webinar today. And thanks to our participants. Uh, in the chat, I have put a link to the roadmap. Also, um, an email address for the Alliance if you'd like to get in touch. And everyone who's participated in this webinar will receive an automatic link to the recording as well that you are very free to share with colleagues. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. thanks.